So, this morning we're on the last of the, uh, the series on God and the rest of our lives. And uh, I drew the short, short straw, uh, so we're going to talk about money. Uh, something that churches are accused of always talking about. Um, but I think God has, has something for us in this. And I have to tell you that this morning I found myself... <sighs> I always do this, choking up on the inside because I felt like, oh Lord, I think I missed the mark because I feel like this is gonna be a bit heady where my heart's desire is that it will touch our hearts. And so um, I hope you will hear this message with that in mind. My name is Andy Stewart. I, I'm one of the non-staff elders at Emmanuel, and uh, I don't get to do this very often. You're about to find out why. So I hope you will come back next week. So the Bible has a lot to say about money. So much so, in fact, that... Uh, I, I struggled because it, it almost seems like it's more of a topic for a series than a Sunday. In fact, I had to make a choice as, as I was preparing, and, and I don't really mean to make this kind of funny, but it's going to be kind of funny. And, and, and Michelle Ann, if you could bring up uh, the, the, the slides uh, that uh, we have the scripture verses on, I had to make a choice because Brad sent me like four emails. I think he drove home the point on the last one that I have between 30 and 35 minutes. And the choice was this. This is the first slide showing the scriptures that I, I referenced, and this is the second slide. The Bible has a lot to say about money. A lot to say. Those of you that are in community groups, you'll get all these verses. We're not gonna dig into every one of them, but I want to, so the decision I had to make was whether to go through every one of them, and we'll be here until about three, or to put them up here for you and just ask you to trust and then verify, okay? That's the approach that uh, I settled on. So I'm going to address this topic from the perspective of general themes and norms in Scripture. And there can be many exceptions to what I'm going to say, especially as our individual journeys are impacted by seasons of life and roles in life. So what I want to encourage you to do is to be listening critically, but not as a critic. Critically, but not as a critic. And lastly, my heart for this message is that by the grace of God, there will be conviction, not guilt. There'll be transformation, not rationalization. There'll be spirit-filled, joy-fueled action, not resentful compliance. That's my heart. Our, our, our key verse uh, for, for this, because uh, I had to have one, uh, is Proverbs, and it had to come from Proverbs. So Proverbs eleven twenty eight: whoever trusts in riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf, which really is a fitting verse for this message. So church, here's the deal. Our lives should be consumed by this. But all too often, they are consumed by this. And it's interesting and ironic that it says right on here, what does it say? In God we trust. Do we? We sometimes allow ourselves to enter into almost a near pathological relationship with money. It's as if it's a measure of who we are. It's a piece of paper representing the ability to buy stuff. 
Stuff that is dust in the wind. Who sang it? Very good. You guys are awesome. <clears throat> How much more foolish can we be than to exchange the glory of God for this? I'm speaking of those two that are, that are followers of Jesus now, and I want to ask you some questions. Did you receive the Spirit? Because you have this? Did you receive the promise because you have this? Are you so foolish that after beginning with the Spirit that you are now trying to attain your goal with this? That's actually a play on words from Galatians chapter 3, and I would encourage you to read it when you go home. This morning, I hope you and I will weigh our own foolishness and then respond however the Lord leads. I recently read that money is mentioned in the Bible over 800 times. Money and possessions, more than 2,300 times. Making it one of the most talked about issues in Scripture if not the number one issue. It's a big deal. I didn't verify the exact numbers, but I did enough searches to feel comfortable saying it's a bunch. Beca perhaps because it's something that we, we, we deal with every day. And, and it's not just the Bible that speaks to it. I picked up the paper this morning, and as I was flipping through the paper, here's... One whole page devoted to the seven deadly sins many folks commit with simple wills, old trusts, online forums, and inaction when it comes to money. Perhaps it's because of the way we relate to money and possessions and, and how it can so quickly come to consume us. Or perhaps... It's because we feel just a little bit more like God. When we spend and when we acquire. Of course, striving to be like God, that's been mankind's defining problem since the beginning of time. When out of balance, money can be addictive and destructive. Its pursuit can consume our attention, always demanding more. But here's the thing. When viewed and held rightly, money is good. Let's pray. Father, I just uh, I ask for your Holy Spirit to fill this place. And Lord, I've come before you so many times, even today, with this fear that uh, what I feel like you've laid on my heart to say is, is, is really kind of almost head knowledge, but Lord, there's so much more to it because it is such a reflection of our heart. So Lord, I pray that you'll move our hearts today in a right and godly way. Bless us as your people today, Lord. Transform us in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we're going to start by reviewing some underlying truths. And because there is so many passages in Scripture that deal with money and money and possessions, um, there are many precepts that we could lay as a foundation. I'm only going to lay three. And, and you, you, you can, at the end of the message, you may say, I wonder why those three. I'm not exactly sure. I felt like those were the three I was supposed to dwell on. Uh, and then we're going to... Uh, touch on some guiding principles related to these four actions pertaining to our relationship with money. And it's earn some, give some, save some, and spend some. So you can say it with me. Earn some, give some, save some, and spend some. I tried to come up with a little dance, but I had trouble when I got to how do you distinguish between giving some and spending some with the dance moves. So I, I didn't come up with the, sorry. So 
and then finally we're going to come back and we're going to wrap up by exploring some overarching principles that should frame our heart attitude in all that we do in relationship to money and possessions. So we're going to jump right in with the precepts. And again, I want, want to clarify that there are a bunch more in Scripture. You can find a ton more. These three. Money is not intrinsically corrupt. Okay? There is nothing fundamentally wrong with having little or much when it comes to wealth. That said, the Bible also teaches that the money in your possession is not your possession. The money in your possession is not your possession. God's word does not give us the latitude to use the money, property, stuff in our charge solely for our gratification and comfort. Yet, God's word also affirms an individual's right to own property and make a profit. It also affirms, affirms that some might even make a bunch of money, have a bunch of property, and have a bunch of profit. Taken together, these truths are clearly intention. They reveal that money in our possession is a resource to be shared and to be enjoyed. That's precept number one. Precept number two. When in want, no one has the right to claim or demand that which is in the possession of another. When in want, no one has the right to claim or demand that which is in the possession of another. You cannot expect to be taken care of just because you want to be taken care of by the church or the members thereof. Also, if there is a need that warrants the body of Christ helping and you are the one in need, you cannot expect to be helped on terms that align with your wants versus your needs. So why say that? Because this, this idea that what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine, they are individually and collectively wrong attitudes, unscriptural attitudes. Third precept. The Lord has each of us on a custom designed journey that is uniquely our own. A journey designed to make each of us face our issues and conform to the likeness of Christ in every way. In our hearts, as Brad discussed during week one of the sermon series, and the outworking of our hearts as reflected in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Your issues may be different than my issues, although I have a lot of issues, so there's probably a lot of overlap. The degree to which money is a battleground at any one time for each of us varies. You may be in the midst of a heated battleground or a battle. You may, at, may be at a point in your life right now where there's relative peace, but I guarantee you, during the course of life, money will be a battleground. Those are the three pre precepts. Now we're gonna, we're gonna transition back to the, these, these four actions. Earn some, save some, no, excuse me, I've got it wrong. Earn some, give some, save some, and spend some, earn some. So to begin wrapping our hearts and minds around a biblical worldview of money and possessions, we need to go back to square one. What do I mean? Well, God charged Adam with a responsibility to work, caring for and advancing his creation. So even after Adam and Eve conscious, consciously chose to disobey God, just as everyone in this room has, and there's three fingers pointing back at me, and thereby perverted all that was good, this call remained in place. Nowhere in Scripture do we find it revoked. Granted, it became more challenging to fulfill after the fall, but the commission was never eliminated. In Genesis, God also approved six days of work, good, hard work, 
and one day of Sabbath rest. And by the way, today's concept of retirement for the able-bodied is, is, is nowhere found in Scripture, with one exception. If you were one of the Levitical priests and you finished that service, then, then you can retire. God did not design us to be couch potatoes. We were made to work. Granted, work can take on many forms, but the bottom line is the same. Fulfillment in life is found in part by being productive, by being hardworking, and becoming proficient and applying that which we've learned, our skills, our gifts, with excellence to produce something, whether it be a physical product, a welcoming home, meals, a painted room, wise counseling, teaching children, or one or more of a bazillion other things. Believers ought to be among the best employees and employers. Above reproach. Are you? So in summary, if you're able, we are to irk. Work. We are to irk. <laughs> I'm irking me. <laughs> we are to work, earn some. Let's transition to the topic of giving some. And I'm going to hang out here a bit longer because I think there are so many misperceptions about what Scripture says about giving. Giving is a privilege. It is freeing and should bring great joy. It shouldn't be burdensome. And if, there, if it is, there's a heart issue. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. There is a heart issue that needs to be dealt with. It's not my job to tell you, nor any of the pastors, how much to give and where to give. Under the new covenant, when I use the term new covenant, covenant, it's equivalent to the New Testament in Scripture. It's on you to decide. It's a matter of the heart and how your heart aligns with God. That said, the Bible provides insight and guidance which you may find helpful in seeking God's will concerning giving. Now, I'm going to be willing to bet, because I've been in the same seat as you right now at different times in life, that some of you may already be kind of churning inside at the mention of giving. You may all better already be rationalizing and justifying and, and, and building a case to defend what you do or what you don't do. And I just want to say, stop it. Breathe. Ask God right now to give you a soft heart and ears that will listen and more importantly, that will hear. The springboard from which we'll build this morning is that nowhere under the new covenant, in the New Testament that is, are followers of Jesus commanded to tithe or give a specific amount. Under the new covenant, we are to give as the Holy Spirit leads. And we find examples of giving to meet the needs of others, to support those in ministry, and to support the spread of the gospel. That said, there is lots of reference information that we can use to provide guidance when seeking what the Lord might have us to do. In the Old Testament, we find the Jews were to give a tithe as part of temple worship. And a tithe means what? It's roughly 10%. That, that's correct. But here's the deal. That was not the only tithe. In the Old Testament, there is evidence of at least two other tithes. One of them was to support the poor. So these tithes came in at different frequencies. So when you, when you look at the numbers, it doesn't, you know, you can't just say 10 plus 10 plus 10 because the frequency was different. Sometimes it was every third year. Now, it's important to acknowledge that the political system of the day was different. The tax structure was different. So it is very fair to say that you can't just take the example of the tithe in the multiple tithes and say that's what the church is supposed to do today. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this provides guidance. We also find 
the first fruits offering in the Old Testament. But similar to the tithe, the concept of the first fruits offering is not directly applied to Christians under the new covenant. If you look at scripture and you look up the term first fruits in the, in the new covenant, you'll find that God has taken it and shifted it from resources to lives. Nonetheless, it provides a valuable point of reference. See, the problem is there is no hard and fast rule. The reality is that in the New Testament, the standard requires much more of you. And I don't mean percentage-wise or dollars and cents-wise. I mean heart-wise. You see, in Scripture, we find several streams of truth that become increasingly clear as they flow from Genesis to Revelation. For example, some of the practices permitted in the Old Testament are later regarded as outside of God's will for his people. As God's people grow, so do God's apparent, revealed expectations. That this concept in Scripture, there's two forms of this. Progressive revelation, one is bad, one is good. In the context of the good one, that's really kind of what applies here. There is a progressive revelation from Genesis to Revelation that basically says we see things with increasing clarity or they can be understood in terms of humanity becoming more and more responsible to God for our actions in parallel with the fuller revelation of God that we find as we move through Scripture. So, for example, in the Old Testament, we are commanded not to commit murder or commit adultery. But as we move into the New Testament, God calls us to a higher standard. Sure, we're not to commit murder or adultery, but in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, we find that even playing with thoughts of murder and adultery are enough for us to be found guilty. In the New Testament, we're challenged to be like Christ and to put him first. That's the highest of standards. So throughout the New Testament, I believe, and I I would challenge you to test this, that we find a common theme of being called to a higher standard than that of the Old Covenant. And I firmly believe that that higher call applies to all aspects of our lives, including giving. When it comes to giving, God desires for us to seek his will, pursue his heart, and to heed his spirit. This is a much greater and higher calling than the Old Testament tithe. So we've covered earn some, give some, save some. Scripture paints a picture that failing to, to save when you can is foolishness. It, 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 and to be clear, it's also obvious that there, there, there may be seasons when you can't save due to circumstances beyond your control. Saving does not represent a failure to dr- trust God. Can it do so? Absolutely. When it's out of alignment with God's word, is it de facto a failure to trust? Absolutely not. Scripture reveals that we have a responsibility to save, whether it be a little or a lot. For life expenses, to care for our families, to be able to share when needs arise. In fact, I'd ask the question, how can we be available on the spot to help others if we have not saved? To support others in ministry, to care for those who may not be able to care for themselves, for a rainy day, for when it may not be possible any longer to work, to provide an inheritance. While the Bible doesn't specify how much believers should save, it it does provide some guiding principles. First one is one of my favorites, because it's so simple. The ant is praised in Proverbs as an example of those who are wise in storing up savings in season. 
And so, just a a few chapters later, is the sun that gathers during the time of harvest. In, in, In Proverbs 13, 11, get rich quick schemes are condemned, while the benefits of saving little by little are extolled. In 1322, leaving an inheritance is commended. And obviously, if you're going to leave an inheritance, that would imply somewhere along the path, you saved. In 2120, a picture of the wise is painted as one who has saved such that there are resources at their fingertips. Not necessarily a lot, not necessarily a little, but they're there nonetheless. So along with encouraging savings, the scriptures also provide some warnings. We're not to amass wealth solely for ourselves. Hoarding is condemned in Proverbs eleven twenty six. Proverbs 3, 27 through 28 speaks to our helping our neighbor in need when it is within our power to act. We're not to store up wealth at the expense of others. We are also warned in Scripture not to allow savings to become a surrogate for relying on God. This is one of the greatest dangers with amassed wealth. We become tempted to begin trusting in ourselves and the resources entrusted to us. How foolish is that? Rather than entrusting in God to give us this day our daily bread. So in summary, save some. But save with an understanding that you are a steward. Don't fall prey to trusting in your savings. We're on to spend some. In the U.S., we are bombarded with messages that encourage spending. By painting a picture that having certain things somehow defines who you are, makes you a better you, a more complete you. Sadly, most of us, even as believers, at some level are guilty of buying into that lie. Now, that said, it's okay to spend some. In fact, it's okay to spend some not only on needs, but to enjoy. Ecclesiastes speaks to that. But as Christ followers, we are not to spend so as to draw attention to ourselves. And we are not to spend at the expense of others. Further, we are to spend based on God's priorities, not the world's. Being careful to distinguish between blessing ourselves and enjoying God's blessings. And lastly, we should strive to live below our means as followers of Jesus, avoiding debt. Debt is slavery. It's not stewardship. Proverbs 22, 7 speaks to that. Now, I'm not saying that you should not buy a house or that you should not have a mortgage, but if you do, when you do, it should be within the framework of the principles that we've touched on this morning. From my perspective, going into debt for depreciating assets or expendables is dangerous territory. You can quickly end up digging a hole that prevents you from both giving some and saving some, both of which are clearly taught in Scripture. So you see, the principles of earning some, giving some, saving some, and spending some all fit together. It's not like you get to pick one of the four or two of the four or three of the four. They all fit together in God's design. So that's all I was gonna say about earning some, giving some, saving some, and spending some. I wanna come back to just some overarching principles, and we're close to wrapping up. When God made you and made me, he made us to be lots of different things. Among those things that he made us to be were lovers, worshipers, and caretakers. As a lover, you are on a hunt to love and to be loved. You will find something to love. You will surrender your heart to something. And whatever it is will shape your life. 
what will you choose to love? Similarly, you were designed to worship, and you will be a worshiper. You will align yourself with something to worship, which will also mold and shape you. Who and what will you worship? And you were also created to be a caretaker, a steward, or a manager. Who will you choose to serve? In our sinful nature, we misdirect our love, our worship to the created, to money and what money gets us. And we see our position as one of owner versus steward. But here's the spiritual reality. If you love and worship money and view it as yours rather than a gift entrusted to you for faithful use, your heart will never be satisfied. But if you love and worship, your love and worship is focused on the source, God, you'll find contentment in both much or little. And you'll be able to enjoy his money and his possessions while keeping them in in the proper place. When all is said and done, a a key question remains. When it comes to money and possessions, when it comes to earning and giving and saving and spending, who are you going to be? Who are you going to be when no one's watching? Who are you going to be when you help someone financially and the recipient doesn't thank you? Who are you going to be when your gift goes unnoticed? Who are you going to be when it feels like every time you turn the corner, you have no money? Who are you going to be when every time you turn the corner, it seems like someone is asking you for money? Who are you going to be when someone cheats you out of money that you feel you're due? When you've been unfairly, unjustly treated? Who are you going to be when someone you've helped in secret attacks or betrays you? Who are you going to be in abundance? Who are you going to be in need? Who are you going to be? A couple of weeks ago when Brad was preaching on sex, he mentioned the thread of two voices that is woven throughout Scripture, the voice of wisdom and the voice of foolishness. And Joe spoke of it last week. The answer to the question, who you're going to be, depends on the voice that you choose to heed. Make no mistake about it. It's your choice, and you are responsible for your choice. The buck stops with you. The voice of wisdom is the voice of God. The voice of foolishness is the absolute opposite. It's the voice that cost Jesus his life. It's the voice of evil manifest as the voice of our own selfish, self-centered desires. Who will you be this day. One who is possessed by money, will it own you? Or by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit that unleashes us to transcend the grip of this world, will you be a caretaker, a manager, a pipeline of the money and possessions entrusted to you? Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Let's pray. Oh, Father. pray that uh, you would just give us a deeper understanding today of the truth of that which you've entrusted to us. That, Lord, you've, you've made us to be hands and feet to a lost world. And the money that uh, you've placed in, in, in our possession, Lord, is, is simply a, a resource to be used for your glory. 
Father, I pray today that there will be people that experience freedom from those shackles that bind them to this world. And that we would be freed to glorify you as your people in every way, including how we use the resources that you have entrusted to us. Set us free from the lies of the world, Lord, and help us to live in victory. Thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. Amen.